Let's take a deep breath, all of us together, and bring ourselves here. <sighs> Another one. Many of you didn't. It's really important. Take a deep breath. Ah. I'm going to talk about Kabbalah and sacred sexuality. There are really three big words, each of them. Kabbalah is a big field. Sexuality is not only a big field, it's deep, and it touches the basic of our being. And sacredness is a word that we really need to open up. What is sacred? What, what do we mean? Or what, at least what I mean when I say something is sacred. That's what we have. I'm sorry. You want to hear, I said before, come on time and come close. Thank you. What is sacred? What is sacred? What's the meaning when we say something is sacred? There is a holy, in English there is holy and there is sacred. Holy usually is something that is holy because the books, the holy books said it. There is some tradition, there is some Bible that said something is holy. It's the holy land, the holy Bible, the holy day. But sacred is different. The meaning of sacred is that Regardless whether someone said with some rabbi or bishop or the pope or whatever said that this is sacred, this is holy, it is sacred because it's connected to the source. Sacredness appears when something or someone is connected to the source, to the source of being. Regardless how you want to call the source of being, in what name, under what religion you want to name it, it doesn't really matter. Whenever we have something that's connected to the source, we feel sacredness. And when it's not connected to the source, you can say that it's, you know, it's holy because it's a Shabbat is holy because someone said, this book is holy because someone said, this place is holy. It's not connected. It's like this mic that it's not connected, you know? It doesn't move. You know, we need, uh, one day the mic will, this mic will open, uh, we'll have the grace, we'll work on it in ten, uh, internally. But sacredness is when the channels are open between the appearance of reality, like where we are, we are in the appearance of reality. This is how reality appears to us. Here you are, you're sitting here, you are in this body, you are in the appearance of existence. When the channels are open between the appearance and the source, that's when something becomes sacred. Just on the surface, we all live in a life that in Kabbalah, is called exile, galut. And it's not the exile from a specific place. It's not being exiled from the country. It's being an exile from yourself. Most people on this planet are walking and living disconnected from their own source. And they feel that they are in exile and they don't even know how to get back home. I don't know where is home. Because home is not in some country and home is not some building. As the song says, home is where the heart is. Home is where the heart is. 
But where is the heart? When we are not connected to the heart, we, don't, we can't find home. When we can't find home, we live in exile. We live in Galut. And we, are, we live like people who are chased by something. As if someone chased us out of our center, out of our home. Megurashim. This is the existential feeling of most people in the world. They don't find home. And home is center. Coming back to center. There's this beautiful, beautiful mantra from Sefer Yetzira, the book of Yetzira, which is the most ancient book that we have written of Kabbalah. And many of the Israelis know it because I composed it as a song many years ago. Imratz libcha, shuv lamakom. If your heart is, ch is running, if your heart is chasing, come back to the place. Literally, it's to the place. The meaning is come back to center. Come back to the source. Because this is life. We're running and we are, we're getting lost from ourselves. And the calling is come back to center. Come back home. Come back home to yourself. When we're coming back home, this moment is sacred. I really want you to forget anything you heard about something is sacred. Holy books doesn't make anything sacred. Incense doesn't make anything sacred. What makes something sacred is one thing, is that you find your way home, that you're connected to your source. So what would make sacred sexuality? What would make sexuality sacred? Not the incense, not mantras, not if you know how to breathe and move the energy from one chakra to the other. It's all nice, you know. It's all nice. If you know how to not ejaculate, that became like the new religion thing. Like, oh, yeah, I cannot ejaculate. It's like, good. Your ego feels great. It has nothing to do with sacredness. Nothing to do with sacredness. There is only one thing that makes something sacred. That you are actually here. That you, your source, is here. And sacred sexuality is when the meeting between the two or the three or the four, whatever you know your sexuality looks like, or self-sexuality. <laughs> what was that? Ah, see, everybody celebrates your arrival. Yes, that's what he wanted. Yeah, cheer to Iran. Yes, thank you. Woo! Great. We we'll open the channels. We said we're gonna we're gonna work on that, right? Uh, the channels will be open. We, here we are. Good. Echo. Echo. Ho. Hey. Ah. <laughs> thank you. That's good. Oh. Okay, so what makes sexuality sacred <laughs> is that all the people who are involved in this meeting, and it can be just me, sacred sexuality can be just you with yourself, or me and my partner, or a big orgy, it doesn't matter. What matter is that you are here. And when I say you are here, of course you are here with the body. But how deep can you go and make your source available? So let me explain what I mean. We walk in the world with an appearance. We walk in the world with a mask. We all do that. That's okay. That's part of being human. You get educated as a child, and you learn what is okay to present. And there are all kinds of things that you learn it's not good to present, and you try to 
not have them and at least not to show them to others. This is called the shadow. We put it in the shadow. We don't want to put it in the light. It's okay, it's part of being human. But when my mask is coming to, sacred sexu to a meeting, to a sexual meeting, when I come with my mask and my partner is coming with her mask, who is meeting? Ah, our parents, <laughs> yeah. It's actually not our parents. I wish our parents would meet, you know? It's the face that we thought that our parents will accept. Yeah, it's a profile. So I'm not there. I'm not there. She or he is not there. And there is no fucking meeting. You can move the energy, you can breathe, you can, you know, spritz from any chakra you want. It, you're not there. And when you are not there, God is not there, sacredness is not there. To make anything sacred is really just like it says in, in Jewish sources, in Chazal, in the Talmud, in the Mishnah. They say, when two people sit with each other, the divine is there. When 10 people are gathering, the divine is there. Now, in Hasidut and in Kabbalah, the way to understand it is that when you're really there, it's not when your body is there, it's not when your profile of Facebook is there. When two people are really there, that's all that is needed. It becomes sacred. It becomes intimate. And one of the beautiful things I learned from, actually, my Zen master passed away, Bernie Glassman, and years and years ago, he said to me, the meaning of sacredness is intimacy. The moment you become intimate with something, this moment becomes sacred. If you are sitting and watching the desert, or sunrise, or sunset, as long as you are in the position of like uh, protected and just watching it like a, an observer, you can be a tourist. But when you drop into yourself so much that you become the desert, you watch a flower and you become the flower. This moment is sacred. You become intimate with a flower. You become intimate with a desert. When you're sitting with another person, if it's just, you know, your appearance is sitting there, your Facebook profile is sitting there, great. It doesn't matter, really. And if you're rubbing your sexual organs together, great. But you're not there. You are not there. What do you need to do in order to bring yourself there? You need to let go of the need to present yourself better than you are. And this is bravery. This is total bravery. Because honestly, sometimes you feel you're going to die. You're going to be rejected. That's what you learn. If you do, da-da-da, <laughs> doesn't matter. Each one, her, their parents told them something. If you show this, you will not be accepted. There's no room for you. You will not be loved. The greatest revelations that I've seen with people in, in conscious communities happens when you, that this day or night, that you dare to show yourself honestly, vul vulnerably, vul yeah, with vulnerability. You stop to present yourself and just like, fuck it. This is, this is who I am. This is, this is me. If you want to reject me, okay. And then what happens is, oh, everybody loves you. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, the feeling usually is like, oh, finally. Finally you're here. I really don't need you to pretend. I really don't need you to pretend. We, as a community, don't need you to pretend. 
But each of us is thinking we need to pretend in order to be accepted. And this is really, really sad. It's really, really sad. It's, it's amazing. In a community, everybody is pretending and everybody is thinking that only something is fucked up only with them. All the rest are okay. But I'm the one who's fucked up. And if I will show myself, I will not be accepted. And as I said, I spent years and years and years in conscious communities, really decades. And the most beautiful times are happening when you let go of that and you just realize that whatever happens, I'm going to let go of the shield and bring myself. And then you find out that you were living in a story. You were living in a legend. It's not true. When you show yourself, you're actually being accepted big time. And that's also for zugiyut, for partnership, for relationship. It's not only for community. People come and, you know, you, you try to initiate a, something with a, a boy or a girl, you know, with a man or a woman. It doesn't matter. You try to put your best self, you know, you have your sentences, you have your whatever you say, the way you move in order to attract them. But if you think about it, what are you, what are you doing? You're actually bringing a mask. You're trying to make them fall in love with a mask. And then you're going to feel lonely because you are not there. You put yourself in a relationship that you're lonely in. And guess what? The other partner is doing the same. And that's what happens in most relationships. Two or more lonely people are in one house. Each one is pretending and afraid to be rejected. Is it really a miracle that uh, so many relationships do not last? Is it surprising us? These relationships did, didn't even start. It never existed. There was a relationship between a, a mask and a mask. But when relationship is real, it's when you let go of that and you say, if love has anything meaningful, it's when it meets the core of me. I don't want to be with people who love the way I pretend to be. I let go of that. At that moment, you let go of a lot of tension that you're carrying. Do you, do you realize how much tension we carry in order to carry a mask all the time? Imagine you're walking with you know, one of those pillars like it's 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 heavy you're you're carrying a big mask all the time there's tension and there is fear behind it because the fear is that i will not be accepted so we're walking with fear can you imagine that with how much fear people enter to what's called love relationship it's not love you're in fear relationship and you're trying to be accepted but you're not really trying to be accepted because in order, in, in order to be accepted, you need to bring yourself. Let go of the mask. Be brave. Bring yourself. If people are going to reject this, they're really not your friends. If they're going to accept this, they are your real friends. Who, the one you, they love is you. Not what your parents taught you that you need to pretend. And this is the meaning of when two people are with each other, this is sacred. That's the simple meaning. When two people are with each other, when ten people are with each other, Ashkina Shura, the divine feminine is dwelling. Because it's not so simple to actually be here without pretendence. But this is the meaning of ending the exile. You know, we are in the state of Israel and the whole myth is, you know, these people that were exiled from the land and came back to the land. It's beautiful, but this is a myth. This is a symbolic thing. The way in Kabbalah to understand it is, you know, let go of this, understand this essence. The essence has nothing to do with a geographical place. 
The essence is, did you actually come home? Or are you still in exile from yourself? When you're coming back home, not only that the friends that you have are real friends, instead of a friend of friends of a mask, but you also don't carry so much tension. You don't live your life by fear. You live in bravery every moment because the bravery is just to be honest, just to breathe, to be yourself. Now, but the question is, of course, what do I mean when I say be yourself? We use it a lot in, in spiritual, new age, slash psychological circles. What does it actually mean, be yourself? Who is the self that we're talking about? Okay, so we got it. It's not the mask. It's not my Facebook profile. It's not what my parents taught me that it's okay. So it's all my shit. I need to bring all my defected, brokenness, Many people understand it like that, and that's what they, they do. They're just like, okay, I come to a relationship and I show you my brokenness, my sadness, my broken heart, my emotions that I don't know how to deal with, anger, rage, depression, self-criticism, all the ugly stuff. So when I show you all my ugly stuff, that means that I'm here? Well, a little bit more than when I show you only the shiny stuff. Uh, but you're not really here as well. Because the one who came when you brought all your brokenness and unresolved emotions, yes, at least you're not pretending, but what you brought is only your personality. Each of us has a personality. It's fine, it's part of being human. We have a body, physical body, and we have a psychological body, which is our personality. And our personality is built from our life experiences. Each of us grew up to a specific family, to a specific community, you were learning a specific language, you were adopted to, into a, a culture isn't it amazing? Sometimes I think about it. You take a child and you put them in China, they will speak Chinese and they will think like Chinese people. And you take the same child and you put them in Russia, they will speak Russian and they will think like Russian people. And you put them in the desert, they will speak Arabic and they will be like Bedouins. It's like the same child, there's nothing. But then you see those people and they seem so different and their values are so different. But it's the same, same human being. So... And of course, you put them with a, a specific family. They will have the experiences of this family, this father, mother, brother, sister, whatever. They loved you. They didn't love you. They hit you. They abused you. They criticized you. Blah, 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 blah. We all have a personality. And it's okay, but it's just, as they say in Kabbalah, the word klipa. Klipa meaning um, a shell, a skin, an outer shell. A shell is very needed, you know. Every fruit has a shell. You need a shell or a skin. It's good. It's, there's nothing wrong with that, but you don't buy a fruit to eat the shell. Same when you want to connect with a person. You don't want to really connect with a shell. The shell is the personality. Can we actually crack the shell and go into the nut? This is the meaning of, in Kabbalah from the, uh, this beautiful verse from uh, Shira Shirin, the Song of Songs, that says, El ginat egoz yaradeti. I come down to the garden of nuts. Uh, you become nuts, but, but that's, that's not a mini. Um, coming, getting down, descending to the nut, meaning in Kabbalah, and there is, there is a lot written about it, is how can you pass through the shells of the nut 
and you are the nut, and reality is the nut, how can I crack the shell and go to the fruit? Because the fruit, the essence, is guarded by the uh, klipa, by the shell. Again, it's good to have a shell, but you want to eat the nut. How can you crack the shell? Sacredness, when we speak about sacred sexuality, it's not actually when I come with my broken emotions and I bring you my personality. It's when I come with a crack nut shell. That's what Leonard Cohen said. There is a crack. A crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. That's how the light gets in. You need to have a crack. And the crack is a crack in the personality. And the crack, when the crack in the personality is happening, your soul is shining. You might not know how to do that. There isn't, that's the funny thing. There isn't a way to do that. You need to relax into that. You need to drop into that. This is nothing you can do except of being ripe. It's happening to you when you're ripening. And the ripening is when you yourself get bored from your own personality. There's a, there's a stage in life when you're, uh, you're very uh, interested in your own personality. Uh, it's good. That's, when, that's the stage when you're growing the shell. But when you become ripe, the shell, it cracks. The personality is not... It's there, but it's not interesting yourself. You're, you're dead tired of your own fucking personality because you know there's something deeper than that. The personality cannot do that. You know, that's the problem with all the things. Like the, the, now the ego wants to, okay, how do I crack my personality? Like, you can't do that. You are the person. The one who, who says that is the personality. You can't crack yourself. Just relax. Deep, deep relaxation. This deep relaxation we call in Easter falling into darkness. Now, there are two different types of darkness that I want to address here. Also in Kabbalah, there are two different types of darkness, and people do not know the difference, and it's really, really important. The beautiful thing, it's not only in Kabbalah, it's also in physics. So one type of darkness is the darkness that comes from the absence of light. That's the usual darkness, that's night. Right? Or the dark side of the moon. There's nothing dark about the dark side of the moon except that it's not fronting the sun. There's nothing dark about the night except that the sun is not shining. There's nothing dark about the dark room except that you didn't turn on the light. So there's a level of darkness that is just an absence. Heeder o. An absence of light. What do you do with this kind of darkness? You turn on the light. And you can find many, many, in, in all religions, in all religions, people related to that, in all mysticisms. It's really, really old. Actually, there was a Greek um, philosophy school, Neoplatonism from Plotinus, that actually created the whole uh, philosophy on the idea that the source is light, there is a source of light, and the, the light is also good and beautiful and truth. And then there is emanations and emanation, ha'atzalot, ha'achare ha'atzalot, emanation, one emanation after the other, it goes far away from the source of light, and as you go far away from the source of light, you have more darkness it becomes darker and darker and darker. But again, there's nothing, darkness is not a thing. 
It's actually an absence of a thing. And you would find in all mysticisms that they will say to you when they relate to darkness or something evil or ignorance. Ignorance is, what is ignorance? It's an absence of wisdom. And as, you know, Buddha beautifully said, ignorance is the cause of evil. No one is evil. They're just ignorant. People are ignorant. That's why they do bad, so to say, bad things. When the, when the light of consciousness is shining, people's behavior is changing. So all you need to do is shine light. You, you have beautiful quotes about it from Rav Kook, for instance. The, the, the real righteous people at Tzadikim Amitim, they don't complain about the evil. They add justice. That's what he says. Einam kovlim ala risha, ala mosifim tzedek, mosifim chayim. The real righteous people are not fighting with the darkness. If you understand that darkness doesn't exist, why do you fight with that? Just turn on the light. Bring more justice, bring more love, bring more consciousness. Everything that is caused by the absence of that disappears. Really just like turning on a light in a room. But this is only one level of darkness. There is another level of darkness, also in, in physics. This is really modern modern physics and astrophysics. There's another aspect of darkness. In physics, it's called dark matter and dark energy. Now, if you, you, know, you Google it and you open Wikipedia, I don't want to you know, re repeat the obvious. Uh, and if you don't know it, just Google it later. Dark matter and dark energy are 90 Six, approximately 96 percentage of what exists in the universe. All that we know, all that we know of, all the stars, all the galaxies, everything that exists is approximately 4% of what exists. Most of existence is dark. Now, this darkness, why do we call it dark? because it's not shining light. It doesn't produce photons, light uh, particles. It doesn't shine light particles. It doesn't respond to light. So dark matter is here. It's not somewhere else. It's like here, here, between you and I, in the space between the electrons and the center of the atom, the core of the atom. All this, so to say, empty space, it's not empty, it's full of dark matter. It's here, you are full of dark matter, we are full of dark matter. Dark matter and dark energy are here, as well as everywhere in space and time. And... But it doesn't show itself in none of our measuring machines. You can't shine light of that. You shine light on this darkness, it doesn't stop being dark. That's a completely different uh, level of darkness. There's a darkness which is absence of light, but the dark matter is not absence of light. It just doesn't, res it doesn't respond to light. It's not from the same category. It's dark by essence. It's darkness by essence. This is completely different. Which means it lacks nothing. It, it doesn't, dark matter and dark energy are not here because they lack something. This is what they are. And this is the darkness that when you tap into that, you go down the rabbit hole. So before we go down the rabbit hole, I want to just like summarize where we are. Right. Sacred sexuality or sacred anything, sacred anything is when the, the core of your being is present. The source is present. What is the source? You can go closer and closer to the source. 
So yes, open up your heart, be vulnerable, bring your brokenness. But your brokenness is just the darkness that is absence of light. Your brokenness is a result of, of the ignorance of your parents, for instance. If each of us is a result of some ignorance, some, some geniusness, let's put it like that, but some ignorance of your parents caused you to be a little bit uh, fucked up, like we all are, just in your specific way. <laughs> so this is a darkness this, that is an absence of light. Your brokenness is an, this kind of darkness that is an absence of light. But there is a deeper darkness than that. This deeper darkness has nothing to do with brokenness. It's not broken. It's a mystery. The deep darkness of existence is the deep mystery that exists here and now. And the only way to connect to that is to change the um, um, tuning of your radio. As long as we are tuned to the wavelength of what exists, what we see, matter, light, energy, personality, as long as I'm tuned to get you the way you are, your body is or your personality is, I get you to a certain degree. But imagine what happens when I tune my radio to a different wavelength. I tune my radio to feel your soul. Of course, in order to do that, I need to tune my radio to feel my own soul. We need to be on the same length, wavelength. But when we tune our radio to go deeper, it's like, yes, I see your body. Yes, I see your personality. I know you're sad. I know you're broke. I know you're angry. I know your parents fucked you up. It doesn't really matter. I'm too. We all are. That's okay. Relax. I want to actually feel your soul, who you are. And who you are is not who your personality is, but what is the spark of the divine in you? What is the spark of divinity that emanated through everything and embodied as you and as me? So I'm a mystery. I am a mystery. I'm a mystery that I can never actually fully know. And you're a mystery that can never be fully known because this is the definition of mystery. Again, mystery is not lack of knowing. It's not ignorance. Mystery is something that can never be fully known, but can be felt, can be tuned, can be vibrating. One of the unique things about sexuality is that what happens in sexual occasions is that people start to be more wild. They stop, sometimes they stop pretending or they can't pretend. At least there is a moment, you know, orgasmic moments, for instance. You can, you can pretend an orgasm, you can fake an orgasm, but when you're really orgasmic, there's some wildness that is shining out of you that you're not there in some ways. Who is there? The divine moment of orgasm, and I don't mean only the peak orgasm, there's also a depth orgasm. Orgasm is when something deeper than you is taking over. Something deeper than your personality and your performance. People cannot have orgasm when they are dealing with performance anxiety. Right? This is... It makes sense when you understand what, what, what orgasm is. When, as long as I'm dealing with performance anxiety, what am I dealing with? With persona, with showing myself, you know, I want to impress you. I need to let go of that so something deeper can actually shine. And this can shine with a young body, with an old body, with an erected penis, with a soft penis, with a wet yoni, with a dry... It's like 
doesn't fucking matter. When the divine essence is taking over you, this is what we call orgasm. Actually, the word orgasm, when you kind of work, play with it in Hebrew, it's really beautiful. Or means light. Gazem. Mugzam. Right? It's a kind of overwhelming light. Too much. Too, too much to hold. And that's the beautiful. You can hold it. You can hold. You can hold. You can hold your, your persona. As long as you're holding it, your persona is there. The moment you, you actually can't and you have to let go, something else is taking over. And this something else is not only your light, but actually sometimes it's your dark essence. And that's where we're, this is the rabbit hole. Yes, orgasm is orgasm. It's a, um, a supernova, kind of if it's, you know, in space, it's a supernova of a star. But actually through the supernova, there is a, there is a, wormhole to the dark essence of reality. Sacred sexuality is when we are trained to catch it. It's like, I really feel sacred sexuality is like surfing waves. You know, you, to, to learn to surf, to surf, you need to really learn how to catch the energy of the wave in a specific moment. Too early, you miss the wave. It goes passes you. Too late, you're in the foam and sometimes it takes you down. There is a moment that you need to, you're surfing and you're just surfing the energy. The same with orgasmic waves. Now, many people would think that I'm talking about elongating your, you know, being on the edge for a long time. Yes, it's good, but that's not the thing. The wave is a wave of darkness that is vibrating. It can pass through you. Most people have it for a split of a second. And you know, there was some, some mystical experience in this meeting. But then you come back to immediately, like, do you love me? Did I, was I good? Was I good? Am I a good lover? And like, do you love me? Do I love you? Like, what's between us? The, what does it mean that we had sex? Whatever it is, you go back to personality issues and just like, you, you let this pass. But if you're learning actually to, put, to pay attention, if you care, about something that's deeper than the personal, the two personalities meetings and the two Facebook profiles <laughs> meeting. You actually care about the dark wave that finally you cracked for a s second. Or maybe you learn how to be on the edge for longer. So it's not only a second, but you actually can really ride the wave, you ride the wave, you ride the wave. You can ride the wave deeper into the source of being. You ride the wave into darkness. Now I want to... It's like a deep breath because I'm going to ride the wave into <laughs> a little more darkness. So it's like, take a deep breath, shake your little body a little, thank you. Yes, yes, yes. It's a hot day, it's a beautiful day. Let's be intimate with it. That's another thing. Once you're intimate with the heat, it doesn't bother you. Anything that you're intimate with is not bothering you. It's not always easy, but when we're fighting with something, we're not intimate with it. It's like, accept it. You forgot about it. Kabbalah is not a tree, even though we call it a tree of life. It's not a tree, it's a forest. Many, many trees in this forest. One of the, one of the trees, one of the traditions of Kabbalah that is unknown to most people who study Kabbalah, because it's the Kabbalah of the bad guys, so to say, is coming from the school of Kabbalah Shabtait. Sabbatian Kabbalah. Literally, the people who were uh, excommunicated in the 17th and 18th century, they were Kabbalists, very radical Kabbalists, very deep also. And because their conclusions led them to not follow religion as religion wants you to follow religion, 
they were excommunicated and portrayed as the bad guys. They did sacred orgies. Part of their sacred rituals were uh, sexual. And they did many things, many things. And there are tons of books. But I want to relate to one um, really meaningful and deep concept that is only coming through this tradition. It starts with a, with a guy who lived in Gaza, Kilat Kodesh Aza. Yeah? He wasn't uh, from the Hamas. He was Natan Azati. That was his name. He was Nat Natan, Rabbi Natan, from Gaza. It was, used to be a sacred Jewish community in Gaza in the um, 17th century. Nice, if you open, open. <laughs> Toda. Thank you. In his writings from the 17th century, he speaks about two different energies that are playing from the divine source in creation. I'll say it in Hebrew and then I'll do my best to translate the terms. He calls it Or Sheyesh Bo Machshava Lebriat Olamot and Or Sheen Bo Machshava Lebriat Olamot. Two different lights, but this is not light. It's, light is the way to say energy. They didn't have the word energy. There is an energy, divine energy, that has a thought, a plan to create worlds, the universe. And there is another divine thought, divine light or energy that has no thought of creating the universe. It's, in some ways it's simple, you know, you are, whatever you create in your life, you have, you, we want to create something. I'm an author, so I, I sit and I want to write my book. There's part of me that is invested in creating this project and there is another part of me or other parts of me that has no interest in creating this project they didn't think about it they they don't care about me sitting and writing my book they want to do other stuff or they don't want to do anything there's parts of me that are not involved in the creation of this book now this book if you read my book the Shah, so you know it, it has people there it has lives there's drama Imagine all these are, you know, real. And I'm the creator. Part of me is really invested in their life, their dramas. The part of me that's just like, fuck that. <laughs> I stop writing anything. I go and sit on the balcony and eat watermelon. Or I, I do something else. What about all those characters in my book? For them, this part of me, Imagine they are real and they need my energy. They need the energy of the author. This part of me that actually says, like, let's, let's eat watermelon on the balcony. This part of me is disaster. For them, this part of the author that is not interest in, interested in them is an energy that is destructive to their being. Now, here we are. We are in the book. We are the characters in the book. We are the characters in the film, in the book of the creation. The creator, she has part of her that is interested in creating us. This is all she yesh bo machshava lebriyat olamot. But there's other parts of her that said, fuck that not interested in all their dramas and all the, you know, this universe that I created. Well, well, suns, stars, supernovas, black holes. Forget about it. I'm going to eat watermelon. This part of the creator is a disaster for us because it's not interested in our, it's not interested in our existence even. This is all she'en bo machshava lebriat olamot. Now these two lights are in the universe. Even though the 
Light that has no intention to create the world has no intention. You would say it's not here, but no, 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 it's here. And honestly, if you really read, you know, some author's book, if you're really sensitive, you will also see, you know, the little things of the author when he, the author didn't actually care about the character. <laughs> and uh, it's there in the book or in the film, right? It's like it's, if you're sensitive in reading, this energy is there. So let's uh, move it to say in a different way, I would say there is constructive energy and disconstructive energy. Huh? Destructive. Thank you. They call it light, but not because it's light. Actually, the other one is darkness. But light in Kabbalah has nothing to do with light. It's uh, what, what we call energy. Just they didn't have the word energy. So they used light was their closest to the word that they, that they had. So constructive energy is this energy that wants to create. And it wants to create the world. And it's creating this world that we are right now here. This constructive energy that is feeding into the world right now. It creates matter, light, molecules, life, personalities, stories, dramas, everything that we live. The constructive energy is feeding, and actually in Kabbalah we say that creation is not something that happened once, once upon a time, but it's continuously happening. There's a continuous creation. It's always happening. Just like a, you know, a, video, a video film, you need electricity all the time to feed. You take the electricity off, boom, everything disappears. You need energy that feeds it all the time. You are in the film. We are all in the film here. It needs energy that will come every second to create this. And there is. This is the light that is interested in creating the world. But, they say in this branch of Kabbalah, there is the other. There is the other energy. And this energy is not interested in creation. It actually is interested in chaos. In, for us, it's chaos. It's interested in demolishing everything. Because it's not interested in creating it. So if we, this will take over, the world will be demolished. But this energy is here. More than that, they say that the energy that is not that doesn't have the thought is the is the is the um, the bricks so to say that the world is built of think about an architect very sophisticated architect he has a thought to build but he cannot build he's too subtle is too much in his mind. What does he need? He need workers, simple workers that cannot understand maybe the big plan. And if he is building whatever, an opera hall, they're totally not interested in opera. But they know how to carry the bricks, put the cement in place. They, they have the power to create, to manifest the thought of the creator, of the, of the planner. These are, and they are simple, so to say, simple people. By themselves, they would never create anything. They need a thought that will guide them. So in the same way, they say, bear with me. I know I'm going a little uh, into uh, more subtle philosophical Kabbalistic aspects, but bear with me. They say that all sheyesh bu machshava, the light that has a thought of creating the words, is harnessing, rotem, Harnessing 
the light that doesn't have a thought to create the world in order to create the world. It's like the smart architect that is taking all the simple people in order to create what they are not interested in. But he needs them. Without them, he cannot build. So the light that has no intention in creating the world is actually here. It's creating it right now. But if you tap into this light, what it wants to do is to bring everything back to chaos. This is a paradox. Part of the power that actually creates, continuously creates the world, is, a, is an energy that, if you tap into this energy, it wants to destroy the world. But it's harnessed to an intention that, of creating the world. Now, this is beautiful because these are the, this is the second rule, uh, law of thermodynamics. Anyone phys knows the second law of thermodynamics? Huh? Say, increase of entropy. Entropia. I'll, I'll explain. This law, the second law of thermodynamics says, the first one, the first law says that the amount of energy in the universe is, um, um, huh? Finite, is finite amount of energy. The second one, which we're interested in now, is saying that the level of order in the universe is decreasing, going down. It's very simple. You don't need to, you know, it's, it's really simple. When you, two, you see two pictures, in, what, in one picture you see a glass, on a table. In the other picture, you see broken glass on the, f on the floor, all over. The water is spread. And, the w and then you, they ask you, which was first? Which one, which one is first in time? It's very simple, right? You say, it. first the glass was standing on the table, then it probably fell, and it spread all over. So the level of order went down, decreased. You don't think like, oh, maybe they're all the, all the broken glass. Maybe it all gathered together and created a glass. And the water came in. No, you, if you see this, you know they're running the, the film backwards. Because the arrow of time, that's how they say it in physics, the arrow of time is directed towards increasing entropy, which means increasing this harmony, or oh, disorder, sorry, not disharmony, disorder. The level of order is decreasing. Yep. A question? Yeah, yeah. Speak loud. Um, so later, I'll, I'll give time for, for questions. Okay, I'm sorry. I'll give time for that. The, the level of, of order is decreasing, that's how you know time is moving. And the second law of entropy is within material. This is in the matter of this universe. It's a law that is in matter. Basically what, what it says, that there is an, an interest, so to say, an interest in reality to decrease order and increase chaos. This is what they call in Shabbatian Kabbalah, the light that has no interest in creating the worlds. So, and it's, it's really beautiful, because also in physics they say, actually, without entropy, life would not exist. We need entropy, that's how our digestion system is working. The reason that your blood is absorbing oxygen is because the molecules, of the, the atoms of oxygen want to pass to the other side and increase entropy. Life exists because there is a law in physics that actually, if you go all the way with it, will bring the world back to chaos. It's paradoxical, it's beautiful, and we live a paradox.
Now, I'm going to close the, the whole cycle. We can go deeper and deeper with that. But, uh, uh, yeah, there is movement is, is created because of the need of atoms. For instance, you know that if, uh, if you bring cold air to the, to the surface, it wouldn't stay there. It will move all the way, right? This is entropy. Movement is created because the need of not creating order, like you know, all the cold air there, all the hot air there, but it will. Um, the the need of it is to come to homeostasis. This power in the universe is dark power. This is this darkness that is not an absence of light, but it's a thing of itself. The thing of itself in darkness is that there is part in the universe that actually always wants to go back home, always wants to go back to the source. In terms of the universe, it means destroy the universe. In terms of a human being, it means some kind of death. That's why when a person is dying, we say they're, they're going home. There is a part of this that is destructive, but actually in this destruction, there is no. it's not bad. It's not bad that comes from ignorance that is an absence of light. It actually is darkness that is not interested in creating the whole facade of the universe it wants the whole divine to come back to its source and not be light, but be the essence of darkness that is. So when we tap through, when we go through the crack of, it, of myself and of each other, we go through this to your soul and through your soul to the spark of darkness that you are, which is the spark of the divine, and together we go home. When we go home in this way, we feel the sacredness. This is when you feel there is like a click. Like something in us came back from exile. Because appearance is an exile. And when we come back home, we come to the center. We come to darkness. It's actually light coming back to darkness that we feel we came home. And then there is a feeling. It's a very clear feeling of sacredness. It has nothing to do with any religion that will say it's holy. It's just you know that you're connected to the source in that moment. Sacred sexuality is when we know, we learn how to identify this wave of darkness and we know how to ride it. And it's not dark emotions when i speak about darkness it's not those dark emotions not because you're sad or broken you got it right it's because there's something even deeper than your personality that is dark because it's not revealing itself it's dark like dark matter like dark energy it's just not revealing it's existing present with a mystery when we dive into one another's mystery. This is sacred. This sacred sexuality can happen with uh, sexual organs. It can happen also just when we sit with each other, when we lie with each other, when we're intimate with each other, and when we're intimate with ourselves. This is depth of intimacy. It's beautiful in English. Into me you see. Intimacy. But in to me, in, 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 through the facade, through the personality, through the soul, to the source. When the source of the divine is meeting through two people, three people, a whole room of 100, 700 people, there's a feeling of coming home that is sacred. May our temples be like that. Thank you. Taking time. Okay, great. We have a little time for questions. So, yes.
So he says that um, talking about entropy, it seems to this man, what's your name? Ariel. Ariel, that the universe is also going towards more order, not only to more chaos. Well, um, in physics, they will say no. The universe is actually going towards more chaos. It does it slowly. It takes billions of billions of years. But there is total order probably existed in before the Big Bang. Um, complexity is the other side of order. Look, Einstein said a beautiful, a beautiful sentence. It's really one of those pearls of Einstein. He said, the most incomprehensible, incomprehensible, incomprehensive, incomprehensive, right? That's Americans, how do you, huh? Incomprehensible. The most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. Like, if you think about it, like, what? For, it, it didn't have to be that there's actually laws of physics that mathematics will work always the fact that there is or, some kind of order in the universe is a mystery so said Albert Einstein the most incredible thing is that actually we, have, we live in a universe that can be understood even if we don't fully understand it but the fact that we can speak about a law of physics that is valid here and valid 300 million years, light years far away from here is nothing less than a miracle. <clears throat> so the fact that there is order in the universe, I'm coming back to you, the fact that there, that there is some kind of order is a big question. And all religious people will say, haha, this is the finger of God. You know, because material by itself goes into disorder, entropy. Like when we die, our body dissolves. The fact that there is something in my body that takes falafel and coffee and creates a brain and pee, you know, it's a miracle. But this is like something that creates order. When I die, all this falafel becomes earth back. It, this is entropy. It goes and disappears. All the atoms, this, all the molecules break and they disappear. The order that created a, a human being disappears and you become dust. So the fact, you're right, not in the fact that the world is going towards order, but the question that there is some kind of order, even a marginal order, order is a big mystery, the biggest mystery. And that's where, you know, the, uh, the idea of, of intention comes in. That actually there is consciousness. That what creates order is some kind of divine consciousness. That there is a creator or there is, there is a, a consciousness in the universe. That this universe is not a dead universe, but it's actually an intelligent universe. There is intelligence in the universe and that creates, that works like this is the game between the Ol Sheyeshbul Machshava and Ol Sheyenbul Machshava, the light that has um, an intention to create the world and the light that does not have intention to create the world and the beauty that both are needed to create life. Is there another question? Is, is 
side of the life, if I want to get to, let's say, even for example, sexual magic, can it come not from the side of darkness, but from the side of light? Thank you. That's another whole lecture. Thank you. What's your name? Dan. Beautiful, beautiful question. Um, I'll summarize it. Um, what Dan was asking, like I was speaking about dropping into the sacredness of sexuality by dropping into the darkness that is not lack of light, but actually the essence of darkness, and that that which is the where we meet in deep intimacy. But he said, what about, what about going through the light? And you mentioned sex magic, or I just heard sex magic? For example. For example, yeah. So, I will just say it in a, in a very short, it, it is a matter for a whole other big lecture. What is the greatest sex magic? What, what is sex magic? Sex magic is creating, creating something but, using your sexual energy. And as you said, the greatest sex magic, the most obvious one, is creating a child. You can't create a child in any other way. No fucking way in the universe, still. They don't know how to create a new sheep, you know, even. They know how to clone it, but not to create a full new thing. You need sexual um, cells to merge in order to create. So uh, sexual energy is in the core of creation. Sex magic is when we create anything by using our sexual intention. So you go into a sexual meeting and you increase the power of creating your uh, project, whatever it is, by actually giving it the energy of, of uh, sexuality. So you create a child, so to say, but not a human child, but a project, a festival, a book, a music, whatever it is. So you use creative energy. This is sex magic. Is this all she yesh bol machshava or all she bol machshava? Is this the light that has thought of creating or the light that doesn't have thought of creating? It has, right? This is this is the light. Yeah, no. It, sometimes it's no intention, but the energy is the energy of creation. Now there is a beautiful thing in Kabbalah that says like this, and I'm. I'm Consciously, I'm going to just like throw it on you, and I'm not going to explain it, but just like maybe it will work in your subconsciousness. Creation is a cathartic, orgasmic process in the divine to cathartically cleanse the source from the dinim, uh, the contractive energy. You will find that the one who actually wrote about it in, in modern language is Shaya Tishbi, one of the uh, greatest uh, uh, scholars of Kabbalah, died already, in his book, Torah uh, Rava Klipa Kabbalah Ta'ari, the, the teachings of, of the shell and the evilness in the Kabbalah of the Ari. Is a book like that by Shayao Tishbi, who was a professor in the Hebrew University. And he wrote a whole, uh, some pages about this, that it seems that, that creation is an, or first of all, creation is an orgasmic process of the divine. Think about the Big Bang. It's like a spritz of semen, right? That's why you have the Milky Way in the sky. <laughs> Milky Way, sorry. So the, also in Kabbalah, they thought that. Creation itself is an orgasmic effect of the divine. In a very ancient book that's called Emek HaMelech, the Valley of the King, um, it says that the source of everything was a self-pleasuring of the divine. It's like God was sitting on the masturbation chair, to put it in a vulgar ways. Sha'ashu'ei HaMelech Be'atzmuto. That's how you call it in Kabbalistic high language. The creator is having fun with oneself, with himself. And from this shashua, shashua is having fun, 
Um, and Shashua in Hebrew has to do with Na'anua and with Tatua and with Gargua and with Babua. All those are a, a line of creation, um, which is like having fun and creating movement and creating the universe. It all starts with an orgasmic power. But not only this, it's a cathartic orgasmic. Catharsis is cleansing. Catharsis is a term in Greek that relates to some kind of cleansing. Like, so let's say if I have uh, aggressive energy in me, a cathartic pro uh, process would be when I let go of these um, energy, uh, aggressive energies and I will stay only with my calm energies. So a cathartic orgasmic process, it's like an orgasm that drives away the dinim, the contractive energy from the source of the divine. In a recent book, I mean, a, a very ancient book that was only recently printed from one of the most crazy Kabbalist books. It's called Ba'avua Yom El Ha'ayn by Rabbi Yonatan Ebschitz, 18th century. He claims that the light that has a thought to create the universe was needing to be cathartically cleansed from the divine. So the divine can rest in the in nothingness. This is the how he calls it garbage, so to say, <laughs> pile. <laughs> That's how he calls it, Aramata <laughs> Ashpa. That of, the whole creation is basically just like kind of the creator wanting to release tension. <laughs> and get back to the calmness of nothingness that like after orgasm right you have orgasm so one part of orgasm is that you create a baby you can that what might happen right you come you don't know even that the baby started like a whole universe started to be created you're just like resting in nothingness so <laughs> That's how it, it portrayed in this Kabbalistic book, like God has a great, had a great orgasm. From this, this whole universe was created. But all the whole, the whole thing is that actually it can, the divine can rest in its own dark nothingness. So we live, they say they're not like Leibniz, the philosopher said that we live in the the best of possible worlds, they say, uh-uh, no. <laughs> not from this perspective. Actually, maybe not. We live in an uh, ejaculative, cathartic, orgasmic process that, yes, it's creative, but from a meditative point of view, there is another aspect that is equally important, not the creative part, but actually the resting part. What? I said that I'm going to just throw it on you and let your soul process it. I know, I said it. This is a whole other lecture, just like answering a question in a way that I know that is a little bit above, but we just don't have the full length of time. If uh, This is just an invitation, by this I close. This is an invitation to feel the world so I wouldn't look at it as a, you know, a garbage pile or anything like that. Same as when a person is ejaculating or having an orgasm. I don't see it as something is a, um, just a, a jerk off or you know, it's like some dirty thing. It's not dirty. It's a creative process. But on the other side of the creative process, there is the nothingness, the shunyata, as they say in Buddhism. There is the emptiness that is resting on the other side of somethingness. And the invitation is to drop, when we meet in any kind of meeting, to be aware that we're meeting personality to personality and to look for the crack. So actually God can meet God. God, God is, you know, divine can meet the divine. And we can actually rest through 
the appearance through the creative power we can also meet in the darkness of resting of the divine that is beyond time and beyond space but it's here and now thank you let's meet in the temple at night